So yeah, uh, thanks everyone for joining. And um, today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Belichkovich. I hope I got that right. Um, who is a senior research scientist at DeepMind, um, working on. Uh, he's working. He's done a lot of work on graph representation learning and applications to algorithmic reasoning and computational biology, um, including work uh, such as graph attention networks. And today he's going to be talking about um, neuralizing a computer scientist. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for being here, um, especially at a, <laughs> I know it's a late hour for you. So thanks for joining us and I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for the fine introduction and thank you for having me. Uh, no worries about the late hours. It perfectly coincides with uh, NeurIPS releasing decisions. So uh, I had many reasons to stay awake. Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, my name is Petar Velichkovic, uh, I'm a senior research scientist at DeepMind, and today I'll be talking to you about uh, some of our most recent progress on uh, neural algorithmic reasoning and uh, the possible applications that it unlocks for uh, uh, merging uh, classical combinatorial algorithms with uh, machine learning. So what we'll be talking about today are classical algorithms, the likes of which you might see in a computer science textbook. So think things like sorting, searching, dynamic programming, also aspects such as data structures and so on. However, because we are talking about uh, the, this in a deep learning context, we will not just be looking at classical algorithms, we'll also be looking at how we could add just a little bit of neural spice to them to potentially broadly expand the space of applications that, uh, that they have. Um, so what the aim for today is, is we want to address uh, three key questions and I'll try to allocate roughly 15 minutes for each so we have some time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So first of all, uh, just uh, this pr probably doesn't need a lot of motivating in this group, but I just want to kind of take a step back and uh, reiterate why as deep learning practitioners, it is meaningful for us to study algorithms. And further, once we ascertain that it's useful to study algorithms, why might it be a good idea to make neural networks that are inspired by algorithms? And then once we agree that this is a good idea, I'll talk to you a little bit about how we can build neural networks that behave like algorithms, and also uh, talk about some recent work we've done on uh, resources that might help build such neural networks more easily. And finally, um, besides allowing you to build such models, we also have seen some empirical evidence recently that such models do the job when they get deployed. So um, what we want to see and what I also hope to show towards the end of this talk is what are some of the interesting ways in which these algorithm inspired neural networks have been deployed. And hopefully this will also give you some ideas on where you might be able to take the ideas above and apply them for your own kinds of combinatorial problems. So. Um, to begin, I'll just reiterate a quick motivation for why we should study algorithms as a whole field. Uh, I really like algorithms because I think of them as an essential pure form of combinatorial reasoning. So in a way, they're a timeless principle that will remain useful regardless of what model of computation we use. So whether it be CPU, GPU, TPU, or even quantum computing, the algorithm will probably remain the key way in which we reason about computation on, this, uh, on these devices. And we can think about the reasoning completely decoupled from any form of perception, which also allows us to be a bit more rigorous about uh, certain performance metrics we report, for example. And beyond that, algorithms have many favorable properties. They trivially strongly generalize. When you write them for, uh, with inspiration of inputs of a certain size, they will naturally usually work for inputs that are, say, twice as big or coming from a completely different distribution. They will usually trivially compose because they can be expressed in the language of subroutines. Because they're abstractified, you can reason about their correctness and give some performance guarantees and actually prove those guarantees. And because of the way they're written, usually their operations are very nicely interpretable. And uh, when you look at these four points and think about the usual properties of neural networks and deep learning, you can find that actually these properties are very complementary with what uh, deep learning offers. So that's why it's a good idea to think to algorithms when we think about how we can expand the power of the neural models in use today. And just on a personal note, this hits very close to home because algorithms and competitive programming are essentially how I got into computer science to begin with. So to me, working on these kinds of problems allows me to go back uh, full circle to where I started. Okay, 
So assuming we agree on why algorithms and looking into algorithms is a good idea, let's talk a little bit about how these algorithms are actually applied when a new problem arises in the wild. And to start, uh, I'm going to set a very simple, well, seemingly very simple question. I'm going to ask you to you know, write me a program that's going to find an optimal path from A to B, okay? Now, if you are a theoretical computer scientist, what you might expect is you will diligently pull out your Dijkstra hammer or any other favorite pathfinding algorithm that you have. And uh, you will look at these abstractified inputs as graphs of nodes and edges where the edges are weighted. And uh, initially there's a designated source vertex and then you run the algorithm and magically it's going to come back with a suggested shortest path tree, which is highlighted here in red which allows you to figure out the shortest paths from the source vertex everywhere else. Now, this is great. And this is basically the crux of what most computer science classes look like. But there are a few subtle assumptions that the theoretical computer scientist made here, which are usually not given in such classes. And it's partly the reason why this figure is missing a left-hand side. So usually the problems that we encounter in nature, which require the usage of problems such as these, uh, usually the real world setting is more complicated than the actual setting in which this problem was originally proposed. So when I ask you to find the optimal path from A to B, I don't necessarily mean I'm going to give you a graph of nodes and weighted edges and ask you to find the shortest path. I might actually give you tons of real world data, which correspond, for example, to a real world road network with all its uh, sense of complexity, like uh, dynamical asynchronous data, roadblocks, queues, uh, traffic lights, changing weather conditions, and whatnot. And uh, there is a seeming gap between what these natural inputs are actually telling you and what the abstractified problem for the graph algorithm is. Also, it's meaningful to think about what do we even mean when we say optimal path? Do we actually mean shortest? Is just running Dijkstra's algorithm on path lengths going to be enough to answer this question in the most optimal way? You might start to think that, for example, if you're searching for shortest paths in a real world road network or optimal paths in a road network, you might, for example, want to choose the routes that avoid the most cost or routes that uh, are not shortest but get you there the fastest or routes which uh, are going to cause the smallest amount of pollution or blocks for everyone else. So there are many ways to classify this optimal path problem in principle which doesn't necessarily correspond to just invoking a shortest path algorithm on an abstractified graph. But for now, let's ignore the fact that there could be multiple algorithms uh, required to solve the problem. Let's just assume that when I ask you for an optimal path, I'm asking you for a shortest path. Now, we'll get back to this assumption later, but for now, let's look at the simplified setting. And what at least traditionally might be done in this case is you might look at the complexity of the natural inputs and uh, spot some regularities, some heuristics, and based on them, you code something up that takes your natural inputs to a form where Dijkstra can suddenly be applied. This is at least the more traditional way in which uh, algorithms are applied on these kinds of inputs. But can we ever hope to actually manually or heuristically capture all that's relevant from the real world and get accurate predictions every time? Well, it's been known since at least 1955 that the answer to this question is likely no. Uh, actually, in the paper that originally proposed uh, studying the maximum flow and minimum cut problems, the authors had this uh, seemingly innocent paragraph on how figuring out the right capacities for a flow network is to a considerable extent an art, even in the simple case of evaluating capacities of railway networks, even when the individual has been closely associated with the particular territory they're evaluating, the final numbers that you plug into an algorithm, however accurate, are largely ones of judgment and experience. Okay. Now, this is something that typically theoretical computer scientists tend to ignore because in the theoretical computer science setting, we assume the problems are abstractified to begin with. So this kind of step of going from the real world to the algorithm input is not as relevant for the theoretical analysis of the problem. But it is a problem that plagues applications of such, of such algorithms because if you manually try to satisfy the algorithm preconditions and you're not very careful with how you do that, you'll very often drastically lose information. And what this means is that your combinatorial problem no longer accurately portrays the dynamics of the real world. So, okay, you can prove that your algorithm is always gonna give a correct solution and terminate in a certain amount of time, but the environment in which it finds this correct solution is potentially useless. 
And actually, even more fundamentally than this, like let's put aside the issue of are you able to estimate these things properly from data? Sometimes the data you need to apply the algorithm may actually be partially observable. For example, many algorithms in reinforcement learning can find perfect policies under the assumption that you know all the dynamics of your environment. And usually you don't know that, you just have a bunch of pixels or other noisy real world inputs. And in typical settings, this would make the algorithm even completely inapplicable, or you'd have to very roughly estimate the parameters of the model before you could apply them. So clearly there is a bit of a divide between the beauty and abstraction of classical algorithms and the real world problems that they were originally designed to tackle. And what we are going to try to do through the duration of this talk is to attack this problem of crossing from abstract, sorry, from natural real world inputs to abstract inputs by appropriately neuralizing the algorithm. And I will be very precise about what that exactly means in a few slides time. Okay, so what do I mean by neuralizing an algorithm? Let's look back to what I originally said was the setting. We had real world inputs, usually human or heuristic maps is to abstract inputs, and then we can run an algorithm to get abstract outputs. So we have uh, this bottleneck of a manual feature engineer that takes the raw complexity and maps it to algorithm input. And you know, if deep learning history is to teach us anything, whenever there's a manual feature engineer in the pipeline, that's an attractive time to plug in neural nets. So the first point of attack could be, you know, just good old fashioned deep learning replace the human feature extractor with a neural network encoder that takes the complexity of the real world and maps it to appropriate inputs for the algorithm and still apply the same algorithm. So this is a setting that in principle can be made to work, although, and there's some really beautiful research that runs in this particular space, but I think there's three issues that make this pipeline a bit less applicable than, uh, than ideal. So clearly there are problem areas where this is the perfect way to go. But one potential issue is that these algorithms will often perform some kind of discrete optimization, meaning that in order to propagate gradients to this encoder network, you need to uh, be a little bit careful and uh, basically play some interesting tricks. That being said, there do exist some fantastic research proposal for solving this problem. Some of my favorites include the recent work of Marin Vlastelitz and others on differentiating black box combinatorial solvers. However, um, there are some more fundamental issues which will persist even if uh, you are able to get this algorithm working perfectly with perfect gradients propagated through. The first uh, core issue is data efficiency. So even though you might be able to, you know, propagate gradients properly from your outputs to your algorithm to your encoder, uh, you still have to compress the potential really high dimensionality and richness of the real world data onto single scalar values with which you can apply the algorithm. And once you've computed these scalar or low dimensional values, the algorithmic solver then commits to using them and assumes that they are perfect. So once again, if you haven't seen or you don't have enough training data to properly estimate the scalars, you're going to hit exactly the same issues as before. The algorithm will give you perfect solutions, but in an environment which doesn't necessarily make sense. And uh, therefore the very issue we were trying to avoid uh, peaks uh, ahead of us once again. And a third issue, which uh, I've initially said to just cast aside, but what if one algorithm doesn't give you the entire solution of the problem? Like what if the optimal path isn't just something that you get as a result of running Dijkstra, but you might need some clever combination of Dijkstra flow algorithms and so on. And it's not immediately obvious what this combination is. Okay, so there is a scalar bottleneck. And how do we deal with these scalar bottlenecks in principle with neural nets? Well. What makes neural nets really flexible is because they don't rely on scalar values. They rely on high dimensional latent representations, which are high dimensional. And as a result, if I make a mistake with predicting any component of my neural representation, the other dimensions of my vector can hopefully step in and compensate and therefore improve the data efficiency. So what we will do to break the bottleneck from what we had before is replace the hard coded algorithm with a neural network, this processor network P, which now operates in a high dimensional latent state. So note that now our encoder doesn't take natural inputs to algorithm inputs. It takes natural inputs to a latent state, which is high dimensional. And then our processor network spins for a certain number of steps, taking latent state to latent state in a way that whenever you decide to decode from those latents, you can hopefully recover uh, the actual outputs that you care about. This is also a very common setting in graph representation learning. It aligns really nicely with the encode process decode architecture that uh, Jess Hamrick proposed in 2018. 
And uh, okay, let's study this construction in a bit more detail without diving immediately into how we might, might do this. Assuming that I've given you this processor network P, which takes latent states to latent state, such that uh, I can decode the outputs that I care about from these latent representations. What we have now is, first of all, an end-to-end -end neural network pipeline, which means I can fully differentiate it and I have no issues with propagating gradients. And at no point in the middle of the pipeline are there any scalar-based bottlenecks, meaning that I don't have to worry about predicting every dimension of the latents perfectly. And also, in case that I'm not sure that my latent algorithm gives me the full answer that I care about, I can just add a skip connection over this processor, meaning that there can be some model-free queues that go into the encoder or decoder as well. Okay, so this seems to be a potential proposal that solves all of the problems that we outlined before. So now the question is, how can we obtain these latent-based neural networks that will align well with algorithms? And that is what brings us to algorithmic reasoning. So the reason why we come up with a completely separate name for this, like we're training neural networks to be algorithmic, is because what we want when we algorithmically train a neural network, it's slightly different than usual, because we want this network to really imitate the steps of the algorithm as faithfully as possible. And this actually means by default that they must extrapolate. And neural networks typically struggle in the regime when you ask them to extrapolate to say larger inputs or inputs from a different distribution. So algorithmic reasoning is basically an emerging area that tries to fix this issue or just make it a bit easier, primarily through giving some theoretical or empirical prescriptions as to what kinds of neural networks, what kinds of inductive biases, or what kinds of changes to the input features you should do in order to make these networks better combinatorial extrapolators. Now, I must stress, because it's super recent, it's also a super active research area. There's many key papers published only in the few, uh, in the few preceding years. So uh, because it's not the direct aim of this talk and it mainly concerns material I've talked about in previous talks, I'll just give you a very quick rundown of the area. We know that graph neural networks, for example, are a really good choice in this space because they theoretically align really well with dynamic programming. And dynamic programming is a language in which you can express most uh, polynomial time heuristics. And some of our recent work at uh, iClear 2020 explored interesting inductive biases that make them even better reasoners. And specifically, we discovered that for most combinatorial algorithms, you want to use graph neural networks with max aggregation, and you want to tightly supervise them on trajectories. There's a lot of interesting work that came afterwards, like ITER-GNNs, shuffle exchange nets, PGNs, PMP, that expand this to cover interesting aspects such as data structures or uh, non-constant auxiliary memory within the algorithmic computation. And there's been some recent really interesting insights that uh, if you don't just align to the algorithm, but you align in a way that the different parts of the neural network have to learn roughly linear functions, then you can extrapolate way better. And this was a paper uh, published uh, at uh, iClear 2021. So all of these things combined, this yields our proposed blueprint of algorithmic reasoning, which we've published at Patterns this year. So the pipeline at the above is what I was talking about initially. We first pre-trained this neural processor through this FPG pipeline, going from a set of abstract inputs for an algorithm, trying to decode intermediate abstract outputs. Once we've pre-trained a robust processor to do this, hopefully in a way that extrapolates, we have now captured a high dimensional essence of what the algorithm is doing, and we can plug it as a neural component that takes natural inputs through the processor to natural outputs. So we invent new encoders and decoders, F tilde and G tilde for the particular problem we have. And now F tilde P G tilde is a pipeline that we can optimize directly with gradient descent because it's end to end neural. And typically if we want to preserve the algorithmic properties, we can keep the parameters of P frozen throughout this, uh, this part. And uh, if you want to dive a little bit in more about what these architectures are actually doing under the hood, here is another example where these individual representations can be seen as nodes in a graph. And the central processor network P, which usually does most of the computational load, is typically realized as a graph neural network because, as mentioned, they align really well with dynamic programming algorithms. OK, so there is this generic blueprint that allows you to neuralize an algorithm and plug it into a network P. But uh, what resources are there right now if you want to just quickly get started on trying to propose some new architecture in the area? Well, we wanted to create a meaningful way to track progress. And uh, 
we wanted to actually formulate a benchmark that would contain algorithm trajectories that we can learn to imitate with neural networks. And we used the CLRS textbook, Introduction to Algorithms, which is a standard textbook in the area for inspiration. And we built a library that allows us to evaluate the reasoning capabilities uh, and also evaluate the capabilities out of distribution through several axes, such as input size or input type. So we took inspiration from the Intro to Algorithms textbook and proposed the CLRS algorithmic reasoning benchmark, which uh, we recently published uh, on our GitHub page. So you can access it and play with it already with some already uh, given baselines and code to train them. And uh, in particular, the representation that we offer in this benchmark is a sort of unified way to look at 21 standard algorithms like sorting, searching, graph algorithms, and so on from the textbook in an idiomatic way. Here you give, uh, here you have an example specifically of insertion sort and the various uh, helper uh, pieces of data that you have. So we don't just give inputs and outputs. This would, for example, make all sorting algorithms completely equivalent because they all search for a permutation that sorts the input array. We actually provide also all intermediate steps of the algorithm to allow you to really align with the individual rules that the algorithm is doing. And here you can see, uh, like from left to right, the trajectory that we provide for one particular insertion sort sequence. Here you have uh, an array 52431, and you can see the red pointer, which is given at every step, scans to the right, where the blue pointer finds its rightful place in the array. And uh, gradually, the predecessor pointers in this linked list are arranged such that the array becomes sorted. The first element by convention just points to itself. And uh, besides insertion sort, which is given for illustrative purposes, we provide 21 problems in total, spanning a wide variety of classical tasks in graph representation learning over algorithms. And uh, we first look at the performance that our models do in distribution. And it might seem, OK, in distribution, it's actually solving quite a few of these problems reasonably well, like reaching almost 100% accuracy. However, from the point of view of generalizing out of distribution, it's still a super, super challenging benchmark. In fact, the only problem that we can claim to have fully solved out of distribution right now on graphs that are, say, four times as large as training graphs is the very simple breadth for a search algorithm, which aligns really, really well with graph neural networks. All the other algorithms still have a long way to go, and therefore we hope that this benchmark will be a very useful source of measuring progress in the area. And as I said, it's already available if you'd like to try playing with it. Okay, so we've talked quite a bit about how, why it's a good idea to neuralize algorithms, how you can go about doing that, and I've told you about our recently released library that can help you do that uh, right now, and just by running a few simple Jack scripts. Now I will tell you a few examples of how these pre-trained algorithmic components have actually been used uh, in a more naturalistic setting and yielded some interesting returns. So the first thing I'm going to show you is a pure unsupervised representation learning uh, setting where you have a particular, say, bouncing balls physics simulation that's given here as X. And you ideally want to predict how this scene is going to change in the future. So you want to figure out the next snapshots of the of the image where these balls are moving in a particular direction and bouncing off of each other. So as you know, in general, predicting future raw pixels from raw pixels is a generally hard problem. But in this case, we have a lot of uh, redeeming information. We know that underneath there is a physics simulation problem. And for these, we have good algorithms. So in reality, there's not this is not just a very complicated mapping from X to Y. This is actually we have an internalized representation of X, which is a set of particular objects. And then once we have the particular information of those objects, like their radii or their velocities, you can actually run a physics simulator rule, which aligns pretty well with a graph neural network that predicts where these uh, balls are going to be in the future. And actually, if you have that information and some differentiable renderer, you might be able to reconstruct everything that's happening here. Now, the problem is that every single step here has problems of its own. First of all, uh, usually we cannot expect to be given the mapping from X to X bar. Uh, and even when it's given, it's tricky to learn to be deployed generally. Like this is a standard disentanglement problem. And uh, we assume here that there is a clear algorithm that takes X bar to Y bar. And we assume it's the only thing that happens in the scene. Usually there's something more complicated going on than just simple physics forces. 
And also we would have to assume there's either some differentiable renderer or a render that is given to us. So all of these aspects might be seen as cheating in various scenarios. And we typically should not assume that they're given to us, but there still seems to be some inductive bias here that we can explore. Specifically, we know that there is a simulation algorithm that's probably going to help you resolve this problem better. So we want to use it. And this is where our neural algorithmic reasoning blueprint comes to the rescue. And uh, it's embodied in our reasoning modulated representation architecture or RMR, which if you can see from the figure on the right, looks very, very similar to what I presented you previously as the general blueprint. Now our abstract inputs are the positions and velocities of individual balls. And we can first learn a physics simulator, a capture differentiable physics simulator in latent space inside this FPG pipeline where we just teach it to predict next steps. And then once we have such a pre-trained graph neural network, we can pass actual raw pixels through that neural network, pass it through our processor, and then decode the outputs based on those objects. So this is pretty much a one-to-one -one application of the setting that we described before. Um, and you just need an appropriate choice of encoder and decoder to take the input and uh, take it to appropriate object representations and also decode appropriate pixels from these object representations. And um, in both cases, we use the established architectures for those. We use the slot attention module for the encoder and the broadcast uh, uh, decoder module for the decoder. And uh, in this particular case, when freezing the weights of the network based on the pre-trained algorithm, we were able to get a significantly higher uh, reconstruction performance, uh, significant in terms of a statistical test. But we didn't just do bouncing balls, which is a maybe more common example for state representation learning. We also looked at the state representation learning in Atari, where you can learn, you can kind of capture the properties of an Atari emulator inside a graph neural network. So here your abstractified inputs are the individual RAM slots of the Atari, and you teach the message passing neural network conditions on an action to estimate what the RAM slots will be in the future. So this gives you kind of an, a high level inductive bias of how the Atari console works. And then you can pass actually raw Atari frames, extract some object representations through them and pass those through that same message passing neural network to um, uncover uh, latents that you can then optimize. We use a standard self-supervised learning loss uh, that Thomas Kipp proposed in CSWIM. And uh, then we evaluate those representations, like have we learned some interesting generative factors about the, the Atari scene based on this? And as you can see, compared to the baseline CSWIM model in the, right, in the bottom right corner on the baseline for 19 Atari games that we looked at, in principle, it either doesn't make a difference, so the p-value is really high, or it helps, and it helps with statistical significance in more than half of the games that we tried in particular 12 out of 19. So basically, once again, learning how to uh, learning how to imitate the dynamics of Atari in RAM space can be meaningfully transferred to improve, uh, to improve object representations that come out of uh, the pixel space for Atari. And the last uh, um, architecture that I would like to present to you before uh, we hopefully have some time for discussion is how we can use some of these algorithmic reasoning ideas to improve uh, implicit planning. So if you haven't heard of implicit planning, I'll just briefly introduce it through the standard reinforcement learning setting. So we have an agent which acts in an environment and the environment responds to the agent with some observations. And uh, if the agent is further given capacity to plan, so not be purely reactive, the agent can uh, take into account all the observation it's seen so far and spend a bit of time thinking about what it wants to do and its internal model of the world, and then use that planner to actually decide how to act. And some basic variables of what's going on here is that the agent is currently in a particular state S and uh, its uh, objective is to predict a policy pi, which uh, uh, gives it a distribution of which action to take given the current state. When actions are performed, the environment updates the state it shows to the agent and gives the agent any immediate rewards based on a transition model and a reward model that are usually internal to the environment. That's why I painted them in gray. And typically you want to find a policy that will uh, optimize some discounted notion of cumulative reward. Okay. Now in this particular setting, 
there exists a classical computer science algorithm, value iteration, which perfectly solves this reinforcement learning environment. So there's a very clear contractive iteration rule that starts with some value estimates in every state, Vt of s, and updates them to Vt plus one of s, such that when you run it for sufficiently many steps, it is actually provably guaranteed to converge to the optimal solution. So give you optimal values in every single state, which means you can derive the optimal policy. So this sounds fantastic, right? If we want to solve an RL problem, this sounds like something that we should use. However, if you just peek at the equations that uh, the V update rule requires, it needs full knowledge of the transition model P, so the distribution of next states given an action, and it needs to have knowledge of the reward model R. So it needs to know what the rewards are when you do something. And therefore you cannot apply the algorithm directly because usually you don't have access to P or R, you just have access to a bunch of pixels and some reward stream or something like this. So the fact that we have an algorithm that we would really like to apply, but we cannot really apply it because the data that we have isn't appropriate for the algorithm, this makes it a prime target for the blueprint that I introduced before. So let's think about, like, let's go back to the original kind of pipeline that I was showing to you with real world traffic networks and think, how would a human feature engineer make value iteration applicable? So you might be looking at some Atari game like Freeway and realize, oh, it's actually just the grid world underneath. So let me figure out how to properly map this heavy pixelized input into grid world so that then I can apply value iteration algorithm and hopefully that gives me exactly the action that I can take. So this sounds great, only very often like the games are complicated enough or the real world is complicated enough that you cannot quite nicely map it to a fixed tabulated set of states and actions. So we want to automate once again what the human feature engineer is doing. And one way we can do this is we can exploit the fact that the states and actions form a graph and we can try to estimate this graph. And one classical way in which that is done in reinforcement learning is through a latent space transition model. So some neural network T, which takes an embedding of a current state, a representation of an action, and then predicts how that embedding changes. And you want to optimize those embeddings such that the transition model of one embedding and the action is as close as possible to the embedding of the next state. And you want to learn this in the context of self-supervised, typically contrastive learning, because like a very trivial solution to this optimization problem is just pushing all representations to the same fixed point but that obviously doesn't give you any meaningful graphs. So usually you build up a huge uh, replay buffer of experience. Like I took uh, action A in state S and I ended up in S prime and you try to push those S's closer together through the action while pushing away any negative triplets that you, that you uncover in this replay buffer. Once you have trained a transition model like this, you can use it to figure out some local graph around your current state embedding. So you have this Atari frame, we run some encoder Z, like a convolutional neural net to get uh, an embedding of that state, HS. And then we apply our uh, transition model to expand some interesting graph uh, around this particular uh, node. Uh, one easy strategy that we have employed in our paper, and it works really well for most small action discrete spaces, is you can just use breadth for search and so basically exhaustively expand every single action that you have at your disposal. And this will basically give you a nice complete rooted tree at the, uh, at the uh, embedding of the current state that you have. Of course, this doesn't scale with large action spaces or thinking times because the complexity, both computational and storage, is the number of actions raised to the power of the thinking time. But for the problems that we studied in our particular paper, this was sufficient. If you want to do something more interesting, you could take, for example, good model free policies and distill them into interesting uh, like expanders that maybe selectively focus on some parts of the tree. Okay, now once I've constructed this uh, local graph around the node, uh, let's assume further many of these reinforcement learning algorithms also compact with reward or value models, which means you can predict scalar values in every single node you've just expanded from those latents. And you know, when you have those scalars, you can directly apply the value iteration algorithm, right? Something in the style of the Bellman equation will give you, for example, Q values, for a particular state embedding and a particular action. And then you can just directly decide the policy from there. Like you have everything you need to apply the algorithm. And uh, 
it turns out that when you do something like this, you derive a very specific class of implicit planners that have been proposed around the 2017 and 2018, including TreeQN, HRC, value prediction networks, and so on. So a very popular class of models that infers scalar values in every expanded state, and then just basically runs the algorithm over those expanded states. And here is a figure from the TreeQN paper, which illustrates this uh, precisely. So you have a particular state representation, it's encoded into an embedding ZT. Then you use this learned transition model in the latent space to predict some you know, perfect uh, a tree for all three actions, uh, and it has a depth of two. And then you use your value model to predict scalars in every single one of these leaf nodes. And then you can directly apply the value iteration algorithm from these scalars to predict uh, you know, a Q function and from there predict the policy. So this sounds okay. Like basically we've used the power of our transition model neural network and encoder to take a complicated pixel input, reduce it to a tree of neighboring states. And then because we reduced those uh, neighboring state embeddings H to scalars, we could directly apply an algorithm like the Bellman equation. Now, as discussed before, this comes with a bottleneck problem. Even though we're able to differentiate through this whole thing fairly easily, if we make any mistakes in estimating these individual scalars, well, once again, the value iteration will give the perfect solution, but in an environment which doesn't make sense. So as we discussed before, we're going to replace the value iteration algorithm with a neural network in the latent space that is trained to imitate the value iteration algorithm. And as before, we can use graph neural networks. And why can we use graph neural networks? Because graph neural networks align really, really, really well with value iteration. In fact, here I've given it very pictorially. You can literally tear apart the different components of the value iteration rule and find corresponding parts in the graph neural network update rule. So this was pretty good inspiration that we can exploit this alignment to learn a graph neural network in the style of algorithmic reasoning that imitates the individual steps uh, of value iteration. And uh, we were able to do this successfully. So now what is different is you start from your state. Once again, you expand the tree of latent space uh, entries around your current node using the transition model T. But now what is different is you don't reduce those embedding scalars. You actually send them straight to your high dimensional neural network that executes latent value iteration. And then, well, you can once again, take a skip connection and concatenate the original state embedding with whatever comes out of the graph neural network and use those to estimate any model free policy or value functions that you need. This is the essence of the executed latent value iteration network, uh, which uh, was uh, joint work with Andrea Deac and others. And uh, since a few hours ago, this was actually accepted to NeurIPS 2021 uh, as a spotlight paper. So besides uh, you know, the fact that in principle, we expect this to ameliorate bottlenecks, I felt like you know, pictorial evidence of this bottleneck occurring would be even more uh, relevant. So we look at Atari games in a very low data scenario. So just over the first say 1 million observed transitions. And we compare this uh, latent space value iteration model, which is in green uh, against uh, uh, a model free baseline, which is in blue. And uh, this H3C model that I mentioned before, which is exactly the same as our architecture, but rather than applying a high dimensional value iteration executor, it reduces all the embeddings to scalars and then runs value iteration like proper. So what you can see is that in all cases, in extreme low data scenarios, our model is ahead of both the model-free model and the uh, H3C model in red. But what's particularly striking is that at particularly low level, well, low levels, this is still hundreds of thousands, 200,000 transitions, uh, the H3C model, which relies on these perfect scalar predictions to apply the algorithm, is actually underperforming even compared to the model-free baseline meaning that it hasn't seen enough data to properly estimate those scalars to apply the algorithm. And as a result, the algorithm, even though it's perfect, gives useless answers at the beginning. And it takes a while before it can catch up. So basically, this is another piece of empirical evidence that if your neural network uh, policy or other kind of representation learner relies on scalar values in the middle, it's actually going to be less data efficient, but since, especially at ultra low data, but if the very purpose of implicit planning is to be more data efficient, then this could be one potential cause for concern.
And we also uh, tested this besides the three Atari games listed here. We also tested it on uh, a variety of uh, continuous space control tasks where once again, from a very small number of trajectories, we were able to outperform the other, the other two methods. Uh, before uh, before uh, concluding this part of the talk, uh, I just want to make a bit of a qualitative point because, okay, we showed that it works on lower data environments, but it still begs the question of why did it work? So we trained an executor network to execute valid iteration. Then we froze it. Like we trained it on a bunch of synthetically generated graph inputs and just trained it to imitate the algorithm. And then we plugged it frozen inside a uh, real RL problem. So now what our encoder needs to do is it somehow needs to learn to take this uh, rich pixel representation into meaningful inputs for the executor's latent space, which is sort of analogous to a human who tries to map real world problems to algorithmic inputs. So we wanted to investigate, at least on some simple toy settings, whether or not this can be done successfully. And we look at some standard grid worlds. The reason why we look at grid worlds is because you can perfectly estimate the value function V star. So you can tell to what extent can the model predict it. And uh, you know we solve it using Xelvin, uh, using this pre-trained frozen uh, executor. And we look at the embeddings before and after applying the graph neural network. And we just try a simple linear regression. Can you decode the optimal value of V star from these embeddings? So right after leaving the encoder, you can see that the R squared of this linear regressor is about 0 0.8, 0 0.85, which is already good. Like this model was completely trained and you would expect the encoder to already capture some good cues for what's the optimal value. But after you pass these embeddings through the frozen pre-trained GNN, the R squared is consistently one. So basically our encoder not only learned to uh, find useful embeddings for policies, it also learned embeddings that once passed through this pre-trained GNN uh, map very nicely to the latent algorithm and give you optimal values in this particular set. So hopefully this is a good uh, convincing argument, a very preliminary empirical argument. I believe there's a lot more interesting work to be done in this space hopefully a good reason to say that in some cases these latent algorithms can already be usable with the kinds of encoders we have today. Now uh, in case you would like to know some more details about how to build good processor networks, as I said I skipped over this in this talk because I had a lot of other talks dealing specifically with this topic. I've given a few talks that are already publicly available and you can look them up on these links uh, which uh, talk specifically about how to build the FPG pipeline. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about Xelvin specifically, I gave a talk about Xelvin that you can also check out. It's publicly available. And uh, in case you haven't come across graph neural networks before, I gave also a talk on uh, theoretical foundations of GNNs, basically talking just about the GNNs for one hour. That can also be meaningful. And uh, if you want to know way more, just you know, not just within the space of uh, algorithmic reasoning, but also the general case for why you should be applying graph neural networks to combinatorial problems, we recently put out a 43 page survey on graph neural networks for combinatorial optimization, which uh, is publicly available in the archive and was also presented this year at IJKAI in the survey track. In particular, section 3.3 deals with the kind of stuff that uh, we talked about today, but there's many other interesting references and problems that you might find interesting, both in the primal and the dual setting. And on that note, I would like to thank you very much for listening. I believe we have about 12 minutes left for, for a Q&A. I'd like to give massive thank you to all of my collaborators who are listed on this slide, without whom this research would not have been possible. And once again, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. We'll be very happy to discuss it with you. And uh, yeah, basically, if you have any other questions after this talk, feel free to reach out to me either via email or uh, uh, my other um, online uh, profiles that are listed on our website. So thank you very much. And thanks once again for inviting me. Yeah, so thanks so much for the great talk. Uh, I guess we can just open the floor to questions. So if anyone has a question, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I can start. Hey, Peter, nice to see you again. Uh, nice to see you as well. Uh, let me just uh, pause the share because of sure. the screen thing. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I have. Um... I have a question, which is, um, is the screen share frozen? Is that, am I, is my face? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. maybe you want to just stop it instead of pausing I it. Uh, I mean, in case I want to show a slide again. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. it's yeah. fine, it's fine. Okay, I'll, 
I don't mind having my face awkwardly pasted. Up right now, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I had a question, which is the following. Suppose, you know, a dynamic programming is, of course, a very powerful framework. And I think this work that you presented is, it, you know, shows, showcases its generality. But there are also like other algorithmic frameworks as well, right? Have you, do you have any general thoughts about how to go? I mean, maybe what you, maybe you'll claim that uh, what you're doing will encompass all of those other algorithmic frameworks as well. Or do you have any thoughts about the boundaries of, of where, you know, other, you know, there might be brand new ways of combining deep learning with algorithmic thinking? That's a, that's a very good question. And I would tend to agree with you that I don't think dynamic programming is the be all end all. It just happens to be like just a very elegant way of partitioning problems into sub problems. And it just happens to like really nicely align with graph neural networks. There's already been some really nice theoretical geometric evidence of this. And we're actually working on some follow-up work to show like a more deeper category theory argument for why graph neural networks are a really good choice here. And, you know, out of the inductive biases we have so far, they just seem to be the best one for this kind of computation. That being said, you know, as you can see in our CLRS benchmark, we're not really solving most of it yet. So I think, for example, string algorithms, recursion, all of these kinds of things, which could be mappable to DP if you squint hard enough, just don't happen to be as easily solvable with graph nets right now. It might just happen that we need better inductive biases for GNNs, but my opinion is we probably want a completely new class of geometric architectures that will be more computationally, not just geometrically aligned to the problem. So I totally agree with you. I don't really know what the answer is right now because we still have a lot of unanswered questions even in the DP regime, but uh, yeah, definitely something of interest to, to look into in the near future. And I also just want to mention, I don't know if, I don't know if you mentioned yourself, but you know, uh, your, your method being used in Google Maps is quite, quite amazing. So I really, I really <laughs> enjoy reading about that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we haven't, I haven't listed it here because while we did take inspiration from some of the neural algorithmic execution work in Google Maps, it's still essentially just a standard graph net with some interesting modifications to its training time. So uh, yeah, although I do hope that there will be more chances to algorithmically neurally enhance what Google is doing, but uh, I'll be sure to report on that whenever we have some results. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So I had a kind of along the same lines of what you song asked. I, I was wondering for this GNN alignment, um, is there some theoretical result you have there or is it, I, I didn't understand the kind of quality, like exactly what the result says there. Yeah, yeah, good point. So uh, here, I think uh, what is very relevant to look at are the papers from uh, uh, Keluk Su, Jingling Ling, uh, Jingling Li and uh, Steffi Gyalka, so MIT basically, uh, papers on uh, what, can, uh, uh, what can neural networks reason about is the first one. And the second one is how neural networks extrapolate. Both are theoretical papers. The first one uh, makes a general uh, result about sample complexity that you're going to have provably better sample complexity if the components of your neural network better algorithmically align to your target function. And in specifically, they show in their paper that for DP problems where you have different nodes corresponding to sub problems and links corresponding to how those sub problems integrate into bigger problems, uh, graph neural networks align really well with their message function and their aggregator to the steps that DP does. So probably they will have better sample complexity than say deep sets or MLPs or something like this. And the follow-up work takes it a step further with linear algorithmic alignment in terms of extrapolation. So let's say you don't just want to learn, you know, with low sample complexity in distribution, a particular algorithm, but also you want it to work for inputs that are twice as big or coming from a different distribution. In this case, uh, it's good not just to have the components aligned to the problem, but also to align linearly to the problem such that they have to learn a roughly linear function. Uh, let me explain on a simple example, the Bellman-Ford algorithm. So here you compute shortest paths by taking the minimum of all of your neighbor distances plus the edge weight. So if you use a GNN with a sum aggregation, now your message function has to actually learn a tricky nonlinear function to cast those inputs into a space where the sum gives you the outcome. We know it can work. Sum is a universal approximator, but you know, doesn't uh, work as easily. Whereas if you change it to a max aggregator, which we empirically showed before works really well, actually now suddenly your uh, message function has to learn just a linear function, has to add the two things together and then the max will take care of everything else. 
So if you design the parts of your neural network or your input features so that the functions you have to learn are as linear as possible, then they geometrically prove that you're going to have much better extrapolation. So yeah, they are actually rigorous proofs, not just empirical observations. I see. Thanks. Um, um, hi, Peter. I have a question. Um, so for this like learning algorithm, I think I remember there are some um, works a few years ago that tries to like mimic the mechanism for memory access in computers. For example, a neural Turing machine or differentiable neural computer. And this work are often evaluated on similar tasks like learning to thought. Um, so what, what do you think of this kind of work or do you think this is um, um, a better inductive bias compared to uh, graphical neural networks or do you think like mm -hmm. graphical ne neural networks maybe are better? Okay, thanks for that question. I think it's very important. And full disclosure, I love neural Turing machines. I love differentiable neural computers. They were some of my favorite papers before I started and all of this. And uh, they definitely would fall within the same space. Like I would think of them as algorithmic reasoners as well. But I think one, there's two issues with uh, the context of when those works were introduced. The first one is uh, back then we were just kind of starting to discover how to properly apply attention in, uh, in neural networks and these kinds of relational models, which are now quite pervasive. Back then people were still just, I mean, neural Turing machines is one of the papers that originally sort of invented content-based attention in a way. So like people were still kind of being fresh with these ideas and these papers, they proposed 20 of these inductive biases at once, right? So there was an external memory component. There was a separate read phase, write phase. There were a lot of things going on, right, uh, at once. And what, meant, what this meant was that uh, the whole architecture wasn't as robust and it wasn't as easy to control. This is why you don't see as often people using NTMs nowadays in like reasoning research, just because it's hard to get them to work properly. So I would say we're doing research that's very much in the same spirit, but we're using, you know, the latest knowledge of graph representation learning and inductive biases. And we're trying to like really carefully introduce one inductive bias at a time. So we try to get really good at modeling, say DP algorithms, data structures, but every single one of those, we try to put out like a separate contribution on this. And I think as a result, we're getting to architectures that are actually able to extrapolate a bit better. So basically, we really love this line of work and we're just trying to kind of do the same thing, but a bit more carefully and slowly and like leveraging the latest insights that we have. And also we're trying to do this part of once you have it, can we deploy it in a real world problem, which I think NTMs weren't really trying to do at the time. Yeah. I see, thank you. So um, by the way, do you, um, you mentioned that there are a few work like explaining the, like the theoretical limits of graphic neural networks. I'm wondering if it's possible for them to like have certain kind of thing like external memory, like reading and accessing, but all in the framework of graphical neural networks. Uh, it is certainly possible. One of the papers I referenced, the PMP paper or persistent message passing was one of our own proposals to do this because we found, okay, GNNs can imitate DP, but they can only imitate DP, which has constant auxiliary memory. And in most cases you might need more memory, right? I think knapsack problem is one popular example of this. So essentially uh, we came up with a framework where you have your initial set of nodes, but then at every step you can create new pieces of memory. And the way in which we do it, there's many ways in which you can do it. You can think of having like a scratch space or something, but we thought that would be harder to optimize. So our assumption is any interesting piece of memory you derive is a function of the nodes that you already have. So basically you do a step of a GNN in your input graph, and then you decide with a separate network which nodes have importantly changed. And those nodes get copied into a new memory cell that gets linked with everything else into a new graph structure. So in this way, we've sort of avoided the issue of how do we populate arbitrary input memory and these kinds of things, and also how to preserve connectivity and so on. It's not the be all end all, but it provides one potentially scalable way of dealing with memory while staying within uh, GNN land. There's some other really interesting uh, 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 architectures in this space, like the temporal graph networks from Twitter, which actually deploy this straight on a real world problem of like the Twitter social network, which dynamically changes with new users joining every time and uh, following each other. So I just cre created and removed and they have like a very similar explicit mechanism for storing and preserving memory in a graph neural network. So those would kind of like the persistent message passing and the temporal graph networks would be the two paper that I would recommend if you want to check how we can merge GNNs in memory. 
that. Thank you. I will check them out. Yeah. So I think uh, we're just question. at time. Sorry. Oh, did someone? Yeah. As, as, so I think we are at time. So if you have any additional questions, I, I guess you can feel free to reach out to Peter. And thanks again for the great talk. And um, yeah, we, I, I really enjoyed it. So I, I guess I'll see you all uh, next at the next webinar then. Bye. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me and feel free to reach out if you have any more questions. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.